Our guest describes how their grandpa, known for his wheeling and dealing, brought home various unique items, including this vase. Initially, the guest was unimpressed with the vase and almost donated it too. When you got it, were you just, did you like it? What did you think? Not at all. When we were cleaning out the house that I, I got it from, I was on the verge of giving it to Goodwill or Salvation Army. Our guest mentions discovering that the vase is made by Guino Gamboni and... So it is now in my home and I'm just curious what the value of it is. Okay. On the bottom, there's a marking. The appraiser confirms that Guido Gamboni who lived from 1909 to 1969, created this vase in the 1950s or 60s, the donkey mask is associated with him. They explain that the vase is geometric, not wheel-made, but coil-made, and features a distinctive rough glaze. The appraiser highlights that this large piece of Gamboni pottery is quite rare and remarkable in size. They estimate that the vase's retail value is to be at a price of I would believe that a retail price would be somewhere between $7,000 and $10,000. Oh, okay. Our guest inherited this necklace from her grandmother. This necklace dates back to around 1880. The beadwork and wire twist design are notable features. The necklace includes split pearls, which are likely natural. This mesmerizing necklace is made of 14 karat gold. The piece is most likely Italian and in the Etruscan Revival style. The appraiser estimates its auction value to be at a price of. Auction purposes, I would say anywhere between $4,000 and $6,000. Okay, yeah. great. The guest was pleased with the appraisal. The guest brought onto the show a book written by her ancestors, Leonard and Thomas Diggs. Probably 60 years before I touched it, and when I opened it, I couldn't really make any heads or tails of it but supposedly it was written by an ancestor. Leonard Diggs was a well-known English mathematician and surveyor, credited with the invention of the theodolite. Thomas Diggs was an English mathematician and astronomer, and he was the first to postulate the dark sky paradox. Furthermore, this particular book was published in 1597 and still has its original parchment binding. Looking at the book's title page, we can see the author's name and title a geometric practical treatise named Panometria. And the title is A Geometrical Practical Treatise Named Pantometry. There is also an illusion of a device being used to measure the size of a fortress and another illustrating the measurement of the height of a tower. On another page, we can see the illustration of a device called the Theodelius, which was invented by the Diggs. In this case here on page 35, you see the composition of the instrument called Theodelius. Given that this book still has its original binding and historical significance, it is estimated to be worth. I would put a conservative estimate at auction of $15,000 to $25,000 on it. Although they resemble your everyday table lamps, these lamps are incredibly special. They are lamps that are crafted in 1909 by Dutch artisan Dick Van Erp. Dick was an artisan and coppersmith known for crafting lamps made of copper. The lamp has a rare closed box mark on it and was designed by designer Elizabeth Eleanor D'Arcy Gore. D'Arcy Gore, as she was frequently called, was a great designer of lamps. Here is that D'Arcy Gore was a Russian spy who was with Van Erp to get secrets about the naval shipyard, but whatever happened, she was gone soon. The patina on this lamp is spectacular and immediately draws viewers in. You don't really see those. There's a lot of extra work in venting a cap like this. Only the earlier shades that I've seen have had vented caps, especially something as complicated as this. A close look at the Mika also reveals it's a marbled one. Hold it up to the light. There's a slight orange cast to it. Another indication of original mica. Now, you, you were told that the mica was replaced? Or was well, they, they said they thought it had been. I didn't know. This vase is an original and rare piece of art, and at auction, it would sell for. At auction, 15 years ago, this might have been a $75,000 lamp. And this certainly twenty-five dollars to $50,000 lamp. Really? I've seen... Two, three thousand pieces of inner. This dress is an amazing piece of unlabeled fashion. It's an expertly finished couture ball gown, which was sewn in 1885. During those times, ball gowns represented the romantic dreams of young women. The design and feather pattern on the gown represent the fashion heritage of the time. It's a two piece dress, which was divided into the top and a complete skirt at the bottom. 
Couture ball gowns like this one at the time were made from luxurious fabric like silk and satin as a heritage of fashion. Ball gowns like this one were often created using time-consuming techniques, nevertheless, as an original and early piece of fashion, the ball gown would auction at. I would think at the right auction that this gown would sell between $2,500 and $4,000. Wow. The guest brought an item onto the show that was found in a house his father-in-law purchased in the 1930s. The house was built in 1905, and this supposedly was part of the original furnishings of that house when it was built in 1905, it was a Victorian house. At first glance, this piece has a design similar to those of the New England Pottery Company, but it's not. The item is an American arts and crafts chandelier, dating back to circa 1905 to 1910. It features beautiful rabbit motifs that encircle its shade. Furthermore, the shade consists of delicate stained glass that reflects light uniquely. Behind the rabbit motifs, multiple layers of plating were used to further reinforce the design. It got me to thinking when I saw the shade, well I know it's not a Tiffany shade, but the quality is very nice and the motif is really interesting and it's different. Additionally, the piece has granite cut glass on the inside, giving it a pebbly look. Considering the intricate design of this piece and its current physical condition, it would command a value of. That may sell arts and crafts lighting. This could sell for $10,000. A diverse collection of items, prominently featuring works by Edward Gorey, was recently showcased. Included is a hand-designed Gorey doll named Figbash, filled with rice and signed with Gorey's unique crossed-out signature. Another notable item is a Bahambag doll, accompanied by a limited edition signed book. Since Gorey's passing, dolls like these have become exceedingly rare and their value has significantly increased. I have seen any <laughs> Gorey signatures over the years that didn't follow that pattern. And tell me about the other doll here. The collection also features a signed tarot deck of cards, a signed Amphigory play poster, and a pop-up book. One of Gorey's earliest works, The Green Beads, also forms part of the collection, complete with Gorey's signature. Along the items is a back-to-back -back book signed by Gorey's pseudonyms Ogrid Weary and Doggy A Word. Also a pop-up book <laughs> that's quite nice. And then you've brought one uh, very early book of his over by your side there. Overall, the entire collection of Gorey artifacts is valued at approximately. A fair market value at retail for your entire collection would be $5,000 plus. <laughs> All these violins and bows originally belonged to the guest's brother's wife, who was a professional violinist. Both the violins were Czech, made by two of the best Czech craftsmen. The first violin, made by Ferdinandus Homolka in 1873, was noted for Homolka's high reputation, earning him the title Stradivarius of Prague. This violin was in great condition. The second violin, made by Julius Hubichka in 1927, bore a label from Spindlin and was signed as a homage to his teacher. Although Julius Hubichka is not as renowned as Ferdinandus Homolka, the violin was of excellent quality. The guest mentioned that violinists who visited the Calgary Philharmonic often wanted to try the bows and violins. In a collection, there was one exceptionally good bow identified as the top bow. It was the work of James Tubbs, a renowned English bowmaker, estimated to be from around 1880. Noting they hadn't been played in 25 years, the appraiser estimated the price of the violins to be. Today, a, a homoka like this has a retail price between twenty dollars and $25,000. Despite a non-original button, the tub bow was estimated to be. Even at that, would have a retail value around $13,000. The German bow was estimated to be. A German bow, a good quality German bow, around $1,500. The heel bow with a replaced frog and a repair was estimated at. But even at that would have a value of around $1,500. An orrery, also known as a planetarium, was acquired by the guest at an estate auction. This educational tool is designed to illustrate the workings of the solar system. Interestingly, it features a chain and gear mechanism that simulates planetary motion. Well, we see them from time to time, but what I can tell you is that this is one of the best ones I've seen. It includes a compass and a brass base inlaid with seasonal, monthly and zodiac calendars, manufactured around 1900 by Detroit's Trip and Sea Planetarium Company. This orrery exemplifies early astronomical models. It retains its original box and label, 
which adds to its historical value. This box also includes a photograph of a professor using the orrery in a classroom setting. At auction, this well-preserved piece could fetch between. On a good day at auction, uh, this could bring anywhere from three to five thousand dollars. No good. In 1936, a Marine Corps officer stationed in Beijing commissioned a unique silver set as a wedding gift for his sister. Crafted by the Tailing Company in Beijing, the set was brought back to the US in his footlocker. His sister, who never had children, kept the set in a closet until it was passed down to his child about 25 years ago. Due to its intriguing dragon designs and personal history, she now uses it for special occasions. A relic from December 21st, 1938, this silver set is accompanied by its original purchase receipt. It elegantly links the exquisite craftsmanship of the past with the present. Distinctive Chinese elements include the large heavy box and the Chinese-style locks and handles. At auction, the set could now fetch between. At auction, I think that this would have no problem in selling for between six and $8,000. That's so it's sure. quite a big increase. Yeah. Thank you. No problem at all. <laughs> the guest acquired these pictures as a trade from a friend who inherited them from his father. Well, I went over to his house and he had these prints on the wall. And I had a 37 Ford and I said, man, I like that. Presented are original photographs made by the American photographer, Clarence John Laughlin. He was a book collector and a poet best known for his surrealist photographs of the American South. A master of photography, Laughlin developed a unique process of waxing his photographs, giving them a distinctive look. These particular photographs are some of his earliest works, taken in the late 1930s. Vintage images, just like these, were pivotal in his development as an artist, as they were created around the same time the negatives were made. Showcasing his art of surrealism, these photographs also serve as self-portraits taken on automobiles displaying his sheer brilliance. These pieces are important to Laughlin's career and are highly valued for their historical significance and artistic quality. At an auction, these early works of Clarence John Laughlin could be worth an estimated. The pair, probably seven to nine thousand dollars. Why ain't that something? Yeah, that's good. The item is an oil painting by Helen LaFrance, a self-taught artist who began painting full-time in her late 60s Helen LaFrance was known for her memory paintings, depicting scenes from her rural Kentucky upbringing. The painting features a nostalgic scene, reminiscent of the 1950s and 60s. LaFrance's work gained increased prominence after a documentary and her death in 2020, leading to a rise in value. The piece was purchased around 2014 to 2015 for $1,300. Due to its connection with Oprah's collection and La France's growing recognition, this painting is rare at auction. There was a documentary made on her a few years ago, mm. which I think brought her into greater prominence. And there are a number of big collectors as well as museums. This painting could easily fetch the value of. If this piece were to be at auction, I think that the value would probably be eight to $10,000. Wow. Our guest also owns another painting by La France, further enhancing their collection. The item is a Japanese vase, identified as earthenware satsuma with enameled decorations. It dates from the Meiji period, approximately 1880 to 1920, and features intricate drapery of wisteria and a finely executed cobweb with a dangling spider. The vase's high points of gilding and detailed hand-painted design are noted, Unlike the majority of mass-produced Satsuma pieces, this vase is among the top-tier examples. It bears the gilded mark of a renowned imperial court artist from that era. Despite a general decline in Japanese earthenware pieces, top-quality pieces like this have seen a resurgence. This, however, resides in that very top percent. Oh my goodness. The appraiser estimates its conservative auction value to be at a price of. I would say a conservative auction estimate would be between five and $8,000. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Our guest is delighted with the valuation and plans to continue enjoying the vase. To the ordinary looker's eye, this is just an ordinary serving spoon, but that is far from the truth. The guest presents a silver spoon her husband purchased in Baltimore for about $600. Can you tell me how much your husband paid for the spoon? 
I think he said $600. The spoon is hand wrought with a tapered handle. It's constructed from coin silver. It's hand wrought with a tapered handle constructed from coin silver. Upon turning it over, it is shown to bear the hallmark of the American silversmith, entrepreneur, and industrialist, Paul Revere Jr. As a military officer, Paul Revere is known to have played a major role in the opening months of the American Revolutionary War in Massachusetts. Of the impending British forces arriving at Lexington and Concord. He resumed his work in silver after the war, which I believe stylistically matches when this piece would have been made. After the war, he resumed his work as a silversmith, which, based on the style of the piece, is when it would have been made in the 1780s. The spoon also features a monogram on it, which might be of the direct owner of the spoon and could add immensely to its value. Although the firm continued to exist after his death, what makes this piece so special is that it was handcrafted by Paul Revere himself, and only a few of its kind exist. A proper tablespoon of 9 inches, which is very rare in the market. This piece is valued at an estimated. This spoon would likely garner eight to $10,000 should it cross the auction block. The item in question is an entirely hand-sewn garment with identifiable markings inside the sleeve. These markings include three dots and three SA, indicating it was a size three from Schuylkill Arsenal in Pennsylvania. Although the market for such military materials has declined slightly, the garment's identification and provenance add value. The Schuylkill Arsenal designation enhances its appeal to collectors. Given these factors, the appraiser estimates its current market value to be at. I would say in today's market for this, for the identification, probably five to 7,000. Oh, very good. This valuation reflects the item's importance in the collector's market. Steel production has been called the backbone of America, with its home situated in Pennsylvania. Among many mills is the Homestead Steelworks, home to the creation of armor for battleships, rail for railroads, beams for bridges, and buildings among many others. Presented are a couple of unique and unorthodox pieces of jewelry, steel jewelry. The first piece is a cut steel bracelet dating back to around 1790. The cut steel jewelry industry originated in England, so this piece would have been made there. It features little pieces of steel that are faceted to resemble gemstones. This is steel. Yes, these are little pieces of steel that are faceted. And so these were worn in the evening, so when candlelight hit them. Most likely part of a full necklace and bracelet set, its value is estimated at. At auction, a piece like this would bring somewhere between $800 and $1,200. The second piece is referred to as Berlin Ironwork, having originated from the Berlin Iron Foundries around 1810. In an effort to support their government against Napoleon, the citizens of Berlin were encouraged to give their silver in exchange for these iron pieces, considered patriotic symbols. Interest in these pieces grew immensely in Europe highly collectible and sophisticated ironwork jewelry. This piece would sell at an auction for an estimated. These are very collectible, so at auction, a piece like this would bring somewhere between $6,000 and $8,000. The final piece is a more recent item that dates back to the 1950s. It was made by the San Francisco company, Marsh & Co., founded in 1876 by George Turner Marsh. This piece is a sophisticated construction of steel, white gold, and diamonds, a trademark of the company. Excellently preserved in good condition, this piece is estimated to be valued at. This item at auction would bring somewhere between $6,000 and $8,000. We have on the show today a painting by Johannes Bosboom. Bosboom was a Dutch painter and watercolorist of the Hay School, known especially for his paintings of church interiors. The guest acquired this piece at a garage sale many years ago. Typical of Bosboom's works, this painting beautifully depicts the interior of a church. It was meticulously done in watercolors, with Bosbum skillfully using light and shadow to create depth in the piece. This watercolor painting is characterized by a high level of detail, particularly in the architectural elements. Interestingly, the painting still retains its original frame, which could further enhance its value. Considering that this item still has its original frame and is one of Bosbum's works, it is estimated to be worth. This would sell at a gallery at no less than 20000 and very likely $30,000. I'm shaking. <laughs> Exhibited on the show today is a bronze figure inherited by the guest from her great-grandmother. Bought this statue, uh, paid 160 marks for it, 
back in 1931. This incredible bronze sculpture was made in 1885 by Edward Onslow Ford. Ford was an English sculptor, and much of his early success came from portrait heads and busts. At the base of the figure, we can discern the sculptor's signature, which adds authenticity to the item. A very intriguing feature of this piece is how the fabric of its skirt is beautifully rendered to capture movement. Furthermore, it has a brown patina that gives it a truly eye-catching look. Not many British sculptures like this one are found on the market, and the condition of this bronze sculpture is outstandingly good. At auction, given the rarity and condition of this bronze sculpture, it is estimated to be worth. For insurance purposes, I would think in the $20,000 wow. range. This vase had been in the guest's mother's family for generations, and she inherited it from her mother when she passed away. And it was not valued very highly for her estate purposes, and it was just something I loved and selected. This vase was made by the Down Studio in Nancy, France, circa 1900 to 1919. Most of the pieces made by Down resemble nature, and they were displayed at many world fairs, winning all kinds of honors and awards. At the bottom of this vase, we can see the Dalm Nancy mark in the center. Furthermore, the vase is made of glass and is adorned with a wheat and poppy pattern. It is in polychrome enamel and the base has irises all around the bottom. Interestingly, it is difficult to come by a glass vase without any wear over time, but this particular vase still retains all its colors and shows no signs of wear. Given its present condition and the craftsmanship of this vintage glass vase, it would be worth you would see it for approximately $8,000. <laughs> we have here a bracelet made by the Waslikoff and Sons Company. This particular piece is called the Straight Line Bracelet, crafted since of the 1930s to 1940s. The bracelet is characterized by a sleek straight line design, emphasizing simplicity and elegance. It is set with 36 high-quality diamonds in a single row, creating a continuous sparkle. Furthermore, the straightforward design makes it versatile, suitable for both everyday wear and special occasions. The bracelet is adorned with finely cut and matching diamonds, each measuring between 15 and 20 points. Additionally, the bracelet features a secure clasp mechanism to prevent accidental opening. We can expect this simple piece of vintage jewelry to command an auction price of this is going to be between eight and ten thousand dollars. And are you going to wear it all the time? Showcased on the show is a portrait painting acquired by the guest from her grandmother's estate. It was passed down to my father. It was about the only thing that he got from her estate. This painting was done circa 1910 by Charles Craig. Charles Craig was a prominent American artist known for his depictions of Native American life and the American West. In the lower right corner of the painting, we can see the artist's signature, which adds authenticity to the piece. Typical of Craig's works, this painting captures an Indian chief in his tribal attire. Although we weren't certain about the identity of the chief illustrated, the war bonnet on his head suggests he's from one of the Plains tribes. Furthermore, the tribal chief in the portrait is probably an idealized figure rather than a specific individual. They are a little distracting. Yeah. I'm not absolutely sure what that is. My advice to you, because it's such a beautiful painting and it's otherwise in excellent condition. Conservatively, at auction, this portrait of a Native American chief would be worth. I think a very fair auction estimate on this painting would be between $5,000 and $7,000. Every photograph has a story, and this one of Babe Ruth is no exception. Babe Ruth was an American professional baseball player whose career in Major League Baseball spanned 22 seasons. The guest purchased this photograph from a friend who received it from Babe Ruth in the 1950s. This piece is a gelatin silver print of a very young Babe Ruth in his 20s. It measures 14 by 11 inches and is in excellent condition. What makes this photograph even more interesting is that it's the only known example of this image. Photographs of Babe Ruth are highly sought after by collectors. Given the provenance and rarity of this photograph, it isn't far-fetched that it would be worth. At auction, we estimate it $5,000 to $7,000. Wow. Wow. Our guest today brought in a collection of World War II memorabilia onto the show. A collection of World War II memorabilia from my husband's uncle, and he was a co-pilot on bomber planes in World War II.
which she acquired from her husband's uncle. The guest's husband was a co-pilot on the B-17 bomber during World War II. Included in the collection is a photograph of the co-pilot and his crew, signed by all the members. There's also a photograph of the co-pilot sitting in the cockpit of the B-17 bomber. Furthermore, we have a pin with a paper tag pulled from a bomb that would have been dropped during the war. And then there's a, a pin with this paper tag that would have been pulled from the fuse of the bomb that would have been dropped. We also have a purple heart that was awarded to the co-pilot after he was killed in a mid-air collision. He was also awarded the Air Medal with an oak leaf cluster, engraved with his name on the back. Lastly, an item called the Short Snorter is displayed, bearing the signatures of his crew members. All his buddies would have signed it. Collectors who are interested in this material look for completeness. These items are a time capsule that tell the heroic and tragic stories of World War II, and they would be worth. Everything together, this would be retail, $3,000 to $5,000. Wow. It's, it's quite an impressive group. Our guest shares that his wife bought this stone mask for him as a Christmas gift about 10 or 12 years ago. He ordered it from a dealer who had obtained it in Mexico around 1939. The appraiser explains that such masks were used in pre-Columbia, Mexico. These stone masks were placed over the deceased's face in tombs in, uh, throughout uh, the pre-Columbian world, particularly in Mexico. Genuine stone masks can fetch up to a million dollars privately and $450,000 at auction. The value of this mask is determined by features like exaggerated carvings and engraving details. Unfortunately, this mask is a reproduction made for sale, not an authentic artifact. Despite its reproduction status, it still has a value estimated at uh, a piece like this is going to be worth between $100 and $200. Oh. Our guest brought in a bowl from a collection their stepfather had, which he collected from the late 1900s until his death in 1967. Our guest mentions that their brother has an identical copy of the bowl. The appraiser begins by examining the box, noting it's a late 19th or early 20th century. Chinese works of art dealers and auctioneers love to see well-made late 19th, early 20th century. The box shows decades of wear, particularly where the silk has frayed. This bowl is identified as a Mughal style Celadon jade twin handle dish, inspired by carvings from Hindustan around 1550 and sought after by Chinese Emperor Quinlong in the 18th century. This bowl features a chrysanthemum design with highly detailed petals and a free moving ring. The appraiser dates the piece to the late 19th or early 20th century, based on the quality of the workmanship of the jade. The translucency and natural inclusions in the jade indicate the high quality of the material. The appraiser values the single dish at $8,000 to $10,000 and estimates the pair at. So an auction estimate is likely to be around uh, twenty dollars to $30,000. Oh, wow. This serendipitous find was discovered at a small shop. Upon going to the shop, the guest stumbled upon this intriguing pottery piece and decided to get it for herself. This modest purchase turned out to be a creation from the renowned Marblehead Pottery in Massachusetts. Marblehead Pottery's fascinating history began as a therapeutic venture for young women with health issues. However, the notable intention took an unexpected turn when a change of ownership to Arthur Baggs occurred. Arthur Baggs's acquisition in 1915 marked a new era for the pottery, with this design originating around 1919. The actual pottery was sold to someone else. So Arthur Baggs took over the pottery in about 1915. This particular piece would have been done, the original design, around 1919. The piece's journey from a modest purchase in the early 20th century to its current value is remarkable. Except that it was found that instead of helping the patients, it was putting a lot of stress. Today, this marblehead pottery creation carries an auction estimate of. These days, a very reasonable auction estimate would be $1,000 to $1,500. Okay, wow. Okay, and, and a retail estimate, $1,500 to $2,000. Okay. This seemingly ordinary platter actually has a captivating tale of artistry. An English platter. It was crafted in Staffordshire. These types of platter are known historically as Staffordshire transferware. More importantly, they were specifically designed for American buyers. As we can see, the platter showcases scenes of American life. 
This fusion of English craftsmanship and American imagery create a highly collectible genre. The cultural significance and artistic value of such pieces have grown more over time. In today's market, this platter that represents more than just tableware is valued at. A retail value would likely be between $1,000 and $1,500. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Well, thanks very much for bringing it in. Thank I enjoyed you. seeing it. These pieces were purchased by the guest's wife directly from the artist and had heard about the artist and drove to Melrose Plantation and asked if there were some pictures available. And Clementine offered these two pictures to her. Presented are two oil paintings made by the American folk artist from Louisiana, Clementine Hunter. Born in 1887, she lived and worked on Melrose Plantation and taught herself to paint. Her works gained national attention for their complexity in depicting black Southern life in the early 20th century. The images, somewhat naive, typical of Clementine's style, obviously really captured with great honesty. These paintings are a perfect example of the artist's work, depicting everyday life with great naivety and simplicity. They bear the distinctive signature of the artist, which, based on the provenance, is original. The frames of the pieces appear to be more recent than the paintings themselves, which were executed around 1960. I believe each is an original oil on board. Each was probably executed right around circa 1960. Presented in excellent condition, these pieces would sell at an auction for an estimated. I think I would probably want to insure the two together for $10,000. Whoa. That's incredible. Behind the Museum of Natural History, a chance encounter with Native American artistry led to this acquisition. The guest's late 90s New York City purchase turned out to be a unique piece of Acoma pottery, a molded greenware sculpture. It is signed D. Antonio and showcases the intricate sclafito technique. I've had a hard time finding information on it except for what's written on the bottom. Okay, let's, let's look at the bottom here and you can see that it's signed on one leg. Featured on the piece are diverse eclectic designs, which includes an eagle and a deer. Despite initial research challenges, the guest now has ideas about the piece's origin and value. You have what we call greenware or molded pottery, and then we have the ones that are handmade. Additionally, there's a growing popularity of large decorated pieces, such as this in the current market. It is even more so believed that in some years' time, this unique sculpture could be worth more than its present value. I want to point out some of the fascinating designs, you know, the, the eagle and the deer, and then there's one on the backside that I really love. The immediate value, however, remains close to the original purchase price, and as such, it is worth. It's probably worth about what you guys paid for it, in the 500 to 1,000 in a, in a retail store. This guest acquired the painting from an online marketplace for free. I acquired this piece for free from an online marketplace. A gentleman was moving. He could not take it with him. I saw that he listed it, that it was going to the trash. Presented is a thick watercolor on silk, bearing an inscription that denotes it was made by Tang Yin, a Chinese painter, calligrapher, and a poet of the Ming Dynasty period. Tang Yin is one of the most notable painters in the history of Chinese art. As one of the four masters of the Ming Dynasty, his influence is seen in the art of contemporaries, notably Kai Han. And that is Tang Yin. And he was one of the four great painters okay. of the Ming Dynasty. The inscription also mentions the summer season and the date in the cyclical form, which corresponds to 1871. Although the appraiser believes that based on the style, the piece belongs to the 1930s and is a copy made in 1871. Apparently, this piece was a faithful copy from an original Tang Yin piece, making it a documentary of the great Chinese artist's work. Based on this perspective and its perfect condition, its value is estimated at. An insurance value or replacement value for this would be, you know, reasonably in the $6,000 range. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Oh my goodness. This piece has been passed down through the guest's family for generations. Unfortunately, I don't know a lot of history about it. I know that it came from my paternal 
grandfather's side of the family. We weren't as close to that side of the family. They lived in Mississippi, and I always thought it was this old, ugly vase. Presented is a Japanese vase dating from the first quarter of the 20th century. It belongs to a group of Japanese ceramics known as hand-painted Nippon. This particular Nippon is even rarer, called coralline. It designs from flowers built up with beads of glass, showcasing a technique masterfully executed. As seen in the intricate detailing and perfection of this piece, a mark on the bottom indicates it was imported, as shown by the U.S. Patent Office stamp. There is a mark here. It actually says U.S. Patent US Office. Pat yeah, yeah, that's so it could be imported into this country. Presented in excellent condition, without a single crack, this vase is a prime example of early 20th century Japanese craftsmanship. At auction, this vase would be highly sought after and is estimated to sell for. Good news about this, value is probably in the $800 to $1,000 range. Okay. This guest owns a record store and purchased this Janis Joplin's wake invitation from a customer who came to his store. Just friends and family to come to Lion Share and just celebrate her life basically after her death. Janis Joplin was an American singer and songwriter and she was one of the most iconic and successful rock performers of her era. The invitation was given out to about two or three hundred people after Joplin passed away and it is an iconic piece of rock and roll memorabilia. To me, it's a really important, iconic piece of rock and roll memorabilia. Janis Joplin, one of the greatest of all time. On the front of this piece, there is an image of Joplin, and upon opening the invitation, we can see the inscription, Drinks are on Pearl. The party was held at the restaurant mentioned in the invite, the Lion's Share. There is also an insert inside the invitation that says, Bring one guest. We don't want to have too many people. There aren't many of these invites still in existence today, making the piece incredibly rare. At auction. Given the rarity of this piece and the historical significance of Joplin to rock and roll history, it is estimated to be worth. I would probably put an auction estimate somewhere around $3,500 to $4,500. This guest received this piece as a gift from an acquaintance of her father's. Because I was an Al Jolson fan and my dad was involved with the beginning of Talking Pictures, George Groves worked under my father when they were developing the... Presented is a record that is part of the soundtrack of The Jazz Singer, a 1927 American musical drama film directed by Alan Crossland. It was the first talkie, marking the end of the silent film era. The portion of The Jazz Singer where Al Jolson is playing the piano and singing Blue Skies to his mother. This is a Warner Brothers Vitaphone disc featuring a track where Al Jossen plays the piano and sings Blue Skies. This disc is the sixth out of 15 reels from the movie and may be the only surviving one. Being a sample record, it might only contain the process of the sound technology and not the actual finished album. Presented in its original frame, used to preserve the disc, this piece is a monument to the innovation of Warner Brothers Studios. If put up for auction, this extremely rare and valuable piece would sell for. I'd put an insurance value on it of $25,000. Wow. Thank you very much. We have on the show today an Andy Warhol New York Film Festival poster that the guest purchased from a friend. The son had come to clean out this storage unit about 10 years ago and was selling everything for half price of what the original 20-year-old price was. So, Warhol was an American visual artist, film director, and producer. He is considered one of the most important American artists of the second half of the 20th century. This piece is one of Warhol's earliest prints made for a festival at Lincoln Center. The poster features two important aspects of pop art. It is very bright and uses an everyday object in this case, an oversized ticket, transforming it into art. Furthermore, this edition was made on paper and consists of 500 copies. Unlike other editions made on paper, this poster isn't signed or numbered. Remarkably, this poster still retains its originality and is in pristine condition. At auction, given the legacy of Andy Warhol and the condition of this piece, this iconic poster is estimated to be worth. Typically sells at auction for around three thousand dollars, but still fifteen hundred dollars for a hundred and fifty dollar purchase not bad. This guest presents us with a collection of seventeen reindeer reports from eighteen ninety two to nineteen o six. 
Sheldon Jackson Reindeer Reports from 1893 to 1906. These reports were made by Dr. Sheldon Jackson, the then Commissioner of Education in Alaska and a Presbyterian minister. In an effort to rescue the native Alaskans from starvation due to the departure of whaling ships from the Bering Sea coasts, Dr. Jackson documented the situation and the solution. The departure of these ships had a severe impact on the local populations of marine mammals, leaving the Alaskan natives without one of their major food sources. The problem was addressed by transporting reindeer from Siberia to western Alaska as a solution to the food shortages. This collection of reports includes first-hand accounts of the inception, process, and success of the reindeer raising project. Presented in relatively good condition, the collection is significant to the history of the native Alaskans. A collection of this rarity will sell at an auction for an estimated. And the retail market is individual volume selling for about more like 100 to 200. Mm -hmm. Our guest received this wonderful piece of jewelry from her mother-in-law. This piece is called Scotch Agate Jewelry and it originated when the railroad came from England to Scotland it's what we call Scotch agate jewelry. It also has kind of a nickname called pebble jewelry. Interestingly, this jewelry is made of yellow gold and must have been made for someone special because most pieces of this type were made in silver. On the edge of this pendant, we can see striped agate and there are also green stones visible. Around the center, there are four yellow stones, each facing north, east, south, and west. In the center, there is a yellow stone with foil behind it to make it more eye-catching. Upon looking at the back of the piece, we can see the mark of MC and Company. Although we're still uncertain about who made it, this pendant remains in good condition, and while its maker is not yet identified, it would be worth. I would say at auction today, $2,000 to $3,000. Okay. All right? Okay. These pieces have been passed down this guest's family for generations. My parents had it appraised in the 70s, and they appraised it as Royal Worcester. Presented is a porcelain set that the appraiser suggests originated from England. The pieces bear the pattern of a variation called the tobacco leaf, which was originally made on 18th century Chinese export porcelain. However, the colors indicate that these are European interpretations of the pattern, the set is made of soft paste porcelain, produced in Coalport, Shropshire, England, a centre of porcelain and pottery production between 1795 and 1926. Dated to around 1810, it is a dessert set designed for serving sweets and fruits. Although the fruit cooler has a liner missing, the set is otherwise complete. Its value is immensely dependent on its decorations, and this set is estimated to be worth. Insurance value would be between twenty and thirty thousand oh, dollars. Oh my! My mom's gonna see this. And the guest acquired these pieces from his mother's family in New Hampshire. We're in my mother's parents' place in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, all right. These boxes belong to a Mary Churchill, with her initials prominently displayed on the front. The painting on the boxes is one of the aspects that make them so special. While most people might have removed the original painting, it has been preserved in its original form on these pieces. Because if you look at this, you look inside, this box is made of eastern white pine. Mm -hmm. and that's a wood that would be indigenous to New Hampshire in great quantity. The boxes are made from eastern white pine, a wood indigenous to New Hampshire. Additionally, there are delicate yellow decorations surrounding the boxes that add significant depth and style. The top and surface of the boxes remain original with no alterations made since they were crafted. Presented in excellent condition with very good provenance, these pieces are quite valuable and would cost. I think in an auction situation, these would easily be estimated in the ten to $15,000 range. Whoa. Really? And that's with nothing in them. Who would have thought? From a chance encounter came forth this piece that has with it some music history. The guest stumbled upon the piece a rare Buddy Holly contract from 1957 in Jacksonville, Florida. This document, one of Holly's earliest contracts, details his 1958 Florida tour. Its significance is well amplified by Holly's tragic fate just a year later. Despite his brief career, Buddy Holly's impact on rock music was immeasurable. There's also the fact that the contract is signed by Holly's manager, which adds significant value to it. This piece of rock and roll history serves as a tangible link to a legendary artist, a testament to Holly's enduring legacy and the significance it carries. This contract is valued at.
Signed by his manager for a retail value, they're at the $2,000 to $2,500 range. Okay. This sculpture was thought of to just be a typical antique sale item. A striking piece, it was acquired by the guest for a modest sum, although initially mistaken for marble. Closer inspection reveals it to be alabaster. To actually distinguish the true nature of this material, true experience is needed. It is actually a late 19th century Italian work and showcases the delicate artistry of the time. Plus, the alabaster used to make the sculpture is known for its translucent quality that allows for intricate detailing. Despite its unassuming origins, this alabaster sculpture holds significant value. An estimate for this gem of 19th century Italian craftsmanship would be. Probably go somewhere between $2,500 and $3,000. A cherished childhood memory comes to life in the form of this vintage Mickey Mouse doll. This cowboy Mickey doll was acquired by the guest in 1932 at just two years old. It was produced by the Knickerbocker Toy Company and sports a unique Western theme. Despite some wear, key features like the hat, bandana and guns remain intact. Right. Tor Tori's tail off. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but overall you were pretty good with him. We'll go through Mickey a little bit here. Mickey's missing whiskers and slightly dirty chaps are minor issues in light of its overall condition, which is still quite good. It is also of note that it's quite rare finding a well-preserved piece from that era. The doll's condition and distinctive cowboy outfit contribute to its collectible status. This nostalgic piece of Disney memorabilia, a testament to early Mickey Mouse merchandise, is valued at. I would estimate this at about the $5,000 price range. Oh man. This guest's father-in-law rescued this piece from a pile of junk. My father-in-law was clearing out a house and the owner said that he was going to get rid of a pile of junk and asked him if he wanted to keep any of it. Presented is a pen and ink drawing by the American painter, muralist and printmaker Thomas Hart Benton, a prominent artist of the regionalist art movement. Benton's fluid and sculpted figures depicted everyday people in scenes of life in the United States. This piece was a study for a mural at Indiana University, commissioned for the Chicago World Fair in 1933. It represents the figures in panel number 10, which depicted racial issues in Indiana in the 1920s. Although not very desirable in the past, its connection to the black history of America adds immensely to its value. Preserved and framed in UV glass, this piece is in absolutely wonderful condition. Highly significant to the black history of America, particularly in the early 1920s, this piece is worth. Conservatively, would be somewhere in the perhaps $12,000 to $18,000 range. You really found a treasure under that Monet print in that frame. This piece was acquired from the guest's uncle and aunt's house up in New Hampshire. My wife's aunt and uncle had a farm up in New Hampshire. When they uh, couldn't stand the brutal winters any longer, we we're going to retire to Florida. They asked us and other members of the family to come up and... Presented is a view from the series of view books called the Civiates Orbis Terrarium. In 1570, Abraham Ortelius issued the first atlas called the Theatrum Orbis Terrarium, meaning Theatre of the World, taking inspiration from this novel endeavour. George Brown and Franz Hogenberg issued volumes of this view book, meaning the cities of the world. This collection showed detailed illustrations of cities across Europe, Asia and Africa. This particular piece depicts a scene across a river from a place called Munden in Germany. Now, this is a fairly small city in Germany, a little bit less exciting than some of the other ones. It was issued as part of the fourth volume of the set, which was published in 1588. The value of these pieces is based on the location of the cities, with more significant cities in Europe, Asia or the Americas often being more valuable. Given that this piece illustrates a relatively small city in Germany, its value might be less than more prominent locations, but still holds substantial historical and artistic worth. Despite being from a smaller city, the craftsmanship and age of the illustrations add to its value, estimated at. Print like this, we would probably in our shop sell for somewhere around $700 or $800. It's a wonderful thing. You were absolutely right to be excited when you saw this. Well, thank you very much.